you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, I'm sure you'll have noticed that of late car prices across the board have been skyrocketing. Now for some that's merely a function of recent events. For others these are previously undervalued classics that finally are getting the appreciation they deserve. But others seem to be instead the victims of rampant speculation. For me, the moment any car is worth more used than it was new, it has to be something truly special. And today I'm asking, can a Subaru Impreza be worthy of that title? This though is no ordinary Subaru Impreza, this is an example of the fabled 22B. One of the things that's often made Japanese cars so great is that they will offer Ferrari baiting performance for a much more affordable price. This car's owner Richard, who runs the YouTube channel Challenge the Road, had one of these when they were fairly new, and he sold it for £23,000. Today these can command easily a quarter of a million. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the ingredients that made this car stand out from the rest, why it was so significant, and then we're going to give it a Doug score. No, the other one. We're going to take it out for a drive and see if it's actually any good. Whether it's worth the money people are asking really is something only you can decide. But I'm going to do my very best to give you as much information as I can to make your decision. The 22B is part of the first generation Impreza lineup, now referred to as the Classic. Though today their image is intertwined with rally success, it didn't actually start that way, because to begin with, Subaru continued using the older Legacy. However, very quickly they realised the benefits of the smaller, newer and lighter Impreza and quickly switched over. It took a little time, as it often does in motorsport, for them to find success, but find it they did, and in the most spectacular way. The all-conquering Toyota team with their Celica GT4 had been disqualified, owing to an ingenious but very illegal cheat. This gave us a showdown between the two Subaru drivers, the veteran Carlos Sainz and the Scott Colin McRae. At the very final round here in Great Britain, the championship was decided and McRae was the winner. A British driver at the British rally in a car prepared by British experts delivered us a motorsports hero, in a moment that for many will never be forgotten. McRae could have retired that day and still be revered now. Other videos can tell the story of Colin, Subaru and ProDrive far better than I can, but the important thing here is that the car became an instant icon, and years down the line when it comes to trying to justify ever increasing prices, a legend is always a very helpful thing to have. In 1997, the old Group A regulations were replaced with a set called World Rally Car. The aim of this was to give manufacturers a little bit more freedom in terms of the aerodynamics, bodywork, engine and suspension of their cars. This was still a far cry from the old, nearly unlimited days of Group B, but did allow for slightly more exciting and exotic machinery than Group A. The 22B is essentially a road-going version of the World Rally Car formula, with its two-door body shell and some notable changes. You have a dramatically wider body shell, 80 millimeters over the standard car, so wide in fact that these had to be hand-painted because they wouldn't fit down the normal production line. You've also got a bespoke wing, bespoke arches, a different front bumper, a different rear, and of course some mechanical changes too, including Bill Stein suspension and larger wheels and brakes. 
One of the strangest elements of the 22B story is that nobody's entirely certain where the name actually comes from or what it stands for. The most popular theory, and perhaps most logical, is that it's a combination of the suspension and engine. B for Bilstein and 22 for the unique 2.2 litre turbocharged flat four boxer. This produces 276 horsepower, 268 pound-feet of torque, that's 363 newton meters, and is mated to a five-speed close ratio manual gearbox. Those numbers though should be taken with a pinch of salt because this car comes from the era of the Japanese gentleman's agreement where everything made 276 horsepower. One key factor of justifying enormous asking prices is rarity, and here the 22B scores fairly highly. Originally, 424 were made, with 400 destined for the Japanese market, and the remainder a combination of 16 cars for the UK, 8 for Australia, and a handful of prototypes. However, because in the 1990s the grey market was booming, quite a few more found their way to our shores. Around 50 allegedly arrived, so many that they actually delayed the official ProDrive cars, which had some subtle modifications, and for me, those would probably be the ones that should command a slightly higher premium, on their rarity alone, if nothing else. I don't really want to, but I suppose I have to show you the interior, because if ever there were a part of this car that was going to put the brakes on your ambitions, this is it. There is no escaping it. This is the interior of a cheap Japanese car from the 1990s. There are some nice touches. These blue trimmed bucket seats are, are lovely and this thin rimmed Nardi steering wheel is beautiful, but it's no different to basically any other Subaru of the time. We'll move on, I suppose. This car sits in a rather eclectic garage and has a couple of very famous stable mates two genuine McRae rally cars, a Focus and an Impreza 2. If you want to know more about those or the many other vehicles Richard has, please do check out his YouTube channel, Challenge the Road. For now though, time to find out, is it really that good? I have to admit, there is something of a ritual when it comes to these old turbocharged cars that I absolutely love. If you've had one, I'm sure you know what I mean. You get in it, you want it to warm through properly, you take a few minutes before you finally give it the beans. Then, after you drive, you make sure to properly cool the car down. For me, when I had my Subaru, there was a little village marker about two or three miles away from my house, and after I passed that, I would take things very easy. You park up, you wait 30 seconds before you finally turn the car off, give the turbo time to properly cool. I love all that sort of stuff. Owners of these things will also be very familiar with the ludicrously short oil change intervals, in some cases three and a half thousand miles. It baffles me to see people now hopping in something like a Mercedes A45S that makes even more power from the same displacement. And yes, things have moved on, but I'm not sure they've moved on that much. They just hammer the car from cold, don't bother letting it cool down, and they have intergalactic service intervals too. Then people seem to wonder why on occasion they can be quite fragile. To me, the miracle is that they ever work. Enough reminiscing though, and on to business. A couple of important points to note, this car has only two modifications of any real consequence. It has the obligatory exhaust here, an HKS unit, and I think it sounds absolutely spot on. Gives you that classic Subaru flat four burble, but isn't overly raucous. I've just finished doing the drive-bys of this, and I have to say the car looks and sounds absolutely spectacular. It's sized just right for these kind of roads and the tune from it is wonderful. Yes, the song of the yob if you're of a particular generation, but also an incredibly evocative and iconic soundtrack. By default, these also came with a twin plate and more aggressive clutch. This one has a regular item and is apparently much easier to drive because of it. The car is also running ever so slightly different sized tyres to original. This is because you can't find decent rubber in the correct size. Beyond that and the obligatory gauges and turbo timer, this car is standard. It's currently got 30 odd thousand miles on the clock and Richard actually owns two. The other one has only 5,000 miles on. 
This is the driver, that is the investment. When it comes to these sorts of cars, that's not actually unusual. The chap I knew who had an XJ220 also had another one of those. Richard Parry Jones, Ford's chassis guru, said that you can learn an awful lot about a car in just 50 yards. So, driving this for a very short time, what have I found? First off, the gearbox, an absolute joy, often a Subaru highlight. The five-speed does have a reputation for being the more fragile of the Subaru boxes. The six is a little bit stronger, but this, in a standard car, should be fine. I've no complaints of the action, though. The weighting is on the heavier side, but the throw is very short. It's extremely direct, and there's next to no play in it. The suspension is on the firm side. Around town, you bounce a little bit, but it is reasonably supple and not uncomfortable. These seats are reasonably narrow. Wider frame gentlemen may struggle. I fit in them just fine. It is snug, but that's how I like sportier cars to be. It means you don't feel like you're gonna move around too much and gives you the confidence to really push on. The chassis also talks to you through the seat and, shockingly for a Subaru, the steering as well. As we're coming to a couple of quick bends, let's see what she can do. up from low down is really quite urgent. Let's test just exactly when that turbo spools up. So we're gonna drop it down a gear. She's gonna drop off some speed as well. 2000 RPM, we got nothing, two and a half, nothing. Okay, but 2750, that's where the turbo comes alive. And it pulls pretty strong to about six and a half to seven. The red line here looks to be around sort of 8,000 mark, but by then it's definitely lost all interest. Visibility is excellent. One of the big differences between the classic Impreza's and those that came after, the new age cars, so the Blob Eye, the Bug Eye, and I think the Hawk Eye, is the height of the front. So in the later cars, you do feel like you're sat lower in the car, but I think that's actually a function of the dash being a lot higher. In this, you've got a great view of the road. The A pillars are fairly thin. The B pillars are way back there, so they don't get in the way. And it means you've got a lot of confidence. Despite this being a wide body car, it's still actually fairly narrow. The cabin feels positively tiny. Turbo lag is present, but actually surprisingly minimal. Once you've got it spinning, the car responds really well. This is always something that I loved about Subarus. This will shame a lot of modern turbo engines in its response. quite nice too. You can heel and toe in the car. The clutch takes a moment of getting used to, but after the first or second attempt, you generally got a feel for it. You can tell the outright grip is limited. It's a reasonably warm day, but even with the all-wheel drive system here, by default, a 35-65 split, and will then adjust to suit, it is struggling just a little bit. Not massively, not really anything to write home about, but this is a car that can very very easily lull you into a false sense of security. Yeah, six and a half to 7,000 RPM, the engine just goes, nah, I'm going home for the day. It really can't be bothered. Pick up the speed, the car does really flow very well with the road. There's that nose you've got to watch out for. These cars are reasonably famous for their understeer in much the same way that a modern Audi is. In truth, I think these are actually a lot more problematic. You've got a big weight out front and reasonably high. The idea of a boxer engine, of course, is that you get a low center of gravity. In practice, that's not quite how it works. Be sensible and you can have a lot of fun, but be a wally and things can go very badly wrong very quickly. Though there were just over 400 of these originally built, these days I expect it's quite a bit less. Richard himself had a rather nasty shunt in his 22B, as have a great many others. They're one of these dangerous breed of cars that probably inspire a lot more confidence than they really should. Really does mean 
it's a very effective car from getting from A to B. The suspension comes together, you can place the car with real ease and it feels half as broad as many modern sports cars and compared to a supercar, ugh, this is the easiest thing in the world. These actually make great dailies. They've got an enormous boot in them as well. These have a decent amount of space in the back for passengers as well. Although being a two-door rather than the more common four-door, access is a little trickier. If you do want a limited edition two-door Impreza that's quite a bit cheaper than this, do seek out a P1. They are a pro-drive developed car designed more or less for the United Kingdom. That was partly a response to the ludicrous popularity of these and the huge number of grey imports. So, that steering, it does have more feel than in some previous Subarus, but it's still not quite as agile or communicative as the kind of helm you'll find in a Mitsubishi Evo. Given how tight this car feels, I'm going to make the assumption now that this is probably as good as it's ever going to get. The off-centre response is somewhat slow, but in all fairness, that's probably a good thing. You get the feeling that if you properly upset the car, it is the rear that can actually wind up biting you as well. These do have an adjustable centre differential, you can even fully lock it. It's in its default setting and I'm going to leave it well alone. On longer journeys, I think this would very quickly become quite tiresome. I'm driving now at the national speed limit in top gear. I'm doing 3000 RPM, the exhaust is still making a reasonable noise and if you were then to try and do 70 or more European speeds, it's going to get very boring very quickly. Fuel economy is going to be typical Subaru, not really that good, but that, to be honest, is not the sort of thing you're going to worry about if you're looking at spending 200 grand on one. I have been fortunate enough in this crazy life of mine to drive many of these now iconic and incredibly expensive Japanese cars. Some of them really do live up to the hype. I drove a Supra yesterday and it was absolutely sensational. Likewise, the Skyline GTR, the R32 in particular, has to be one of the most visceral, exciting and engaging driving experiences you will ever find. Whilst I don't like the idea of an R34 at £100,000, I can see why they command that kind of money. So do I feel the same way about this? No. I just don't. This is a really very nice car. I am enjoying driving it. It is the best Subaru I've ever driven. But it's not the best Subaru I've ever driven in my life, ever, full stop. The looks, the rarity, the rally connection, these are all lovely things. But if I'm being brutally honest, and that is what you all expect of me, I don't think there's any one single thing about this car that you couldn't find in any other well-cared-for, tastefully modified Impreza at a tenth of the price. At 40 or 50,000 pounds, I could see reasonably why anybody would be all over one of these. But at 200 grand, which isn't even used Ferrari money, it's new Ferrari money, or nice Lamborghini money, or very nice Porsche GT3 money, the Emperor's wardrobe is looking rather threadbare. If you were instead trying to look at something like this as purely a financial investment, I of course think that's always a terrible idea, but I think something like this is particularly risky. Yes, it drives fairly well, but it's not spectacular. And the simple truth is, it's a Subaru Impreza. As these particular cars don't have themselves a rally pedigree or a history, trying to ask big dollars for them is, I think, going to be quite difficult. Some people are certain now that with these cars approaching the 25-year-old mark, Americans are going to want to snap them all up, and therefore the prices are going to go even higher. For me, Every single car, no matter what it is, does have its limit. Just ask anybody who paid a million pounds for a Ferrari F12 TDF, half a million pounds for a 911R, or bought anything in the late 80s. So there we have it. A huge thank you to Richard for bringing his car out. Don't forget to check out his YouTube channel. Thanks to you for watching. There is my verdict on the incredible, the iconic, and the rather pricey Subaru Impreza 22B. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.